All right, so thanks everyone for joining our next talk, The Economics of Cybersecurity, How Market Incentives Fail to Protect Users from Cybersecurity Threats, uh, but Regulation Can. So we're gonna pivot a little bit. Uh, a lot of the other talks were a little bit more technical. Here we're gonna bring in some economic concepts uh, to how we can uh, hopefully solve some of our cybersecurity issues in healthcare. So first we'll introduce ourselves. I am a serious business woman. Uh, and not a cybersecurity professional, but I play one on TV. My background is in data science, and I have PhD training in econometrics, economics, and psychology. Uh, so I'll be playing the boring economist on this talk, Matt. And my name is Matt McMahon. Uh, I've worked for a couple different medical device manufacturers, uh, and I'm a professor in healthcare and cybersecurity. And we just want to make sure that everybody is aware of the views on this, uh, this talk are our own and not uh, the views of our employers. All right. Um, so we'll start off the talk with just some kind of high level notes uh, about cybersecurity and healthcare. Obviously, it's biohacking village, so we assume kind of everyone's uh, on the same page. But uh, here's kind of three quick uh, cartoons or slides just to to lead off so uh, the one on the left uh, our usual uh, colonoscopy equipment is down today uh, so we're going to use a tapeworm with a GoPro, GoPro strap to his head obviously this is a joke but um, you know in IOMT um, you know there's a lot of we're using medical devices in many cases uh, for you know sometimes for things that they're not necessarily intended for uh, that that opens the door for some for some cybersecurity issues. Uh, also, the middle slide kind of talks to that as well. As a bonus feature, you can plug your iPhone into your new pace uh, pacemaker to charge it. Uh, again, while this is a joke, um, you know if you go into a, a lot of hospital rooms today, you'll see devices, infusion pumps, what have you, that have USB ports that you can plug in an iPhone and it will actually charge. And those do occasionally bring down uh, medical devices. Uh, and then the third point, I see cyber risk everywhere. Um, you know, it is easy to kind of go off the deep end and just say, you know, cybersecurity risks in healthcare are everywhere. There's nothing that we can really do uh, to bring them down. But I think most of us that are in this talk know that um, with some uh, with some good thought and, and mitigations, you can lower that risk to hopefully a reasonable level. So that's what we'll be talking about here today, how we do that with economics. All right, next slide. All right, uh, so a few key points. Again, we're not going to get too deep into cybersecurity and healthcare because we assume that most of you are working in that space. But um, the, you know, we, we're all aware there's millions of insecure devices out there in operation uh, with significantly outdated uh, operating systems, and we need to have a little bit more investment uh, to protect patients as cybersecurity risks grow. And the other point I'd like to introduce here is that it's not a technology problem. We know how to solve a lot of the medical device cybersecurity risks, but we don't as an in industry um, or as an economy because the incentives in the market are misaligned or there are insufficient incentives for manufacturers to invest in the technological solutions that already exist. And we'll set about to try to prove that and show the solutions uh, and the rest of the talk. All right, so most of us know the risk is increasing. It's not decreasing. The number of legacy devices continues to increase, unfortunately, uh, and risks are growing. Certainly we've seen with COVID, uh, the number of cyber attacks against the healthcare sector is significantly increasing, uh, not decreasing. So the risk to broader healthcare networks, uh, which has a negative uh, or has a potential for a adverse effect for patient safety, unfortunately, is increasing. Uh, so just to give a little bit of background, and we're not going to go through all these uh, examples. Again, obviously, most of us are probably familiar with this, but, you know, WannaCry obviously brought down a significant number of UK hospitals, um, completely brought them down. Um, and then the, the Dusseldorf example, which many of us are familiar with, uh, was the first example where while a couple of Wired articles have kind of walked this back, it was believed to be the first attack that had that that directly led to uh, patient fatality. But again, there's been some articles that have kind of um, called into question if that may be the case. 
Matt, do you want to talk a little bit more about um, the impact of cyber risks specifically in healthcare? Like, what's at risk here? It's not just data privacy, right? Yeah, so obviously, certainly data privacy, um, a a uh, health record sells on the, the the dark web for anywhere from 10 to 20 times uh, you know what a credit card record sells for obviously you can't turn off a healthcare record like you can a credit card record but also exactly patient safety um, you know if if results are changed um, doctors can make uh, do when doctors diagnose based on those results uh, they could they could make an incorrect diagnosis uh, prescribe a patient an incorrect medication based on that those incorrect results um, or if the device simply isn't available uh, th that could lead to patient injury or even death um, like with the case of stroke uh, there's there's a there's a quick time window or turnaround time uh, that doctors need to be able to see the results of certain tests uh, to be able to then make specific uh, um, uh, to, to to then go and treat the patient, whether one way or the other, based on the results of those tests. And if they don't have those tests, then they're really without the information that they need to be able to proceed. So that could really affect patient care. So it seems like it's clear that the risks exist in healthcare and shouldn't consumers of healthcare, and by consumers of healthcare, we mean hospitals, like they're buying medical devices, and individuals, I'm buying my, you know, medical device, which is in my Apple Watch. Um, I'm buying uh, probably my infusion pump, or I'm buying it through my insurance, uh, my insulin pump, rather. So you'd think that as a buyer, I would want to buy secure products. However, the economic theories we're going to introduce are probably pretty familiar to me. It's pretty obvious, but on a market level, make huge impacts on how um, cybersecurity is or isn't incentivized. So first, information asymmetry. Consumers don't know what a secure product is. They can't necessarily assess that product's quality for, and you know, it's cyber hygiene. Um, they're unaware of how it how much it could impact them the the risk isn't present and they don't know how to evaluate so they just don't buy cybersecurity um, there's a couple exceptions with hospitals like Mayo Clinic has been sort of a standout star in its cybersecurity acquisition program um, but in the end if there's a new device that improves patient care and is better for healthcare overall um, if it's a little insecure they're still going to buy it. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of the way the market is right now. They're not willing to pay a premium for security if they can't, if a consumer can't assess whether or not that security really is embedded into the device. Um, another bit is psychological bias. You know, we just think we're everything's going to go well. Like we're short-sighted. That's what myopia is in that middle column. Um, and then a tragedy of the commons is well, somebody's going to make sure things are secure, right? We wouldn't put things on the market that aren't. Um, or that don't meet some securable, patchable baseline. Um, and we look to the FDA to do that. But the FDA is doing this for newly, too. They need to innovate. And we'll talk a little bit that, uh, more about that later. Um, so I hope you pardon me for the theoretical aspects of the next bit of the talk. Um, but we're just kind of laying a foundation of why economics matters for cyber risk. Um, on the other side, why don't manufacturers do this? Manufacturers should just know that they need to secure their products. It's healthcare after all. Um, however, any company is only gonna invest to the level of risk that exists. And if the risk is, is to the patients, but the manufacturer doesn't feel the risk, they're not gonna invest it. Um, so this is the left column. The, 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 those in charge of protecting a system or reducing risk are not the ones that suffer if it fall, fails. So manufacturers are not suffering if someone dies as a result of a hospital being down because we're not tracing that risk back to an original manufacturer. Um, it probably can't be done anyway. They're not suggesting that's the way it needs to go. Uh, but the problem then is who bears the risk? It just becomes a public risk that, that, that uh, unfortunately the patients bear uh, and we can't prevent. Matt, is there anything else on this slide that you'd really want to give to this audience? Um, I think you've covered most of the salient points. Cool. All right, so we'll move on 
to bear with me. So, so just um, this isn't necessarily in healthcare, but we found a paper that showed that chief information security officers buy security products or buy security solutions for two reasons. One, perceived risk to the company. We just talked about the perceived risk to the company not being high enough uh, for medical device manufacturers. And two, compliance, um, co regulatory compliance. They do it because they have to. And just a quick question, Matt, you've got experience inside and outside of medical device manufacturers. Have you ever heard of a company or an individual foregoing a security best practice like uh, a risk assessment, a robust risk assessment, or, or maybe multi-factor authentication, something simple that uh, you'd think everybody should do um, versus uh, instead investing in like something clinical outcomes, more R&D. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a there's a belief that as a company, you know, there's endless money to be able to invest in in cybersecurity. And the truth is there really isn't a lot of companies um, drive their business lines as, as kind of independent um, businesses. So there, there's really limited overhead. Um, and yeah, certainly if there's only a certain amount of money to be able to invest in the product and you're looking at, you know, potential threat for a cybersecurity risk, um, versus a feature that you know through customer uh, interactions, a number of our a number of the customers have said, hey, we really want this feature. It, it, you know, sometimes it's hard to quantify a cybersecurity risk um, if we don't have like an FDA regulation saying, all right, you need this, or a known customer requirement saying, yes, we will not buy a device like you, you had said, Mayo. Um, you know, we will not buy the device if it doesn't have these say 19 uh, cybersecurity features. Um, so yeah, it's it certainly it. it we definitely have seen um, in companies across the board. I'm sure that they're that they're not implementing certain security features uh, due to this. All right. So we've established that consumers are not good enough consumers to be able to pick out more secure products, medical devices. Manufacturers don't have enough incentive to get ROI on uh, sec security features. Um, how to have other industries solved similar problems. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes left, Matt. Get, check me on, on that timing. Yep, looks about right. Sounds good. So we'll go through these relatively quickly. Um, the banking industry had a similar problem with ATMs, um, so specifically securing ATMs. Um, and the market solution in Europe and America was different. Um, some European cult countries put the burden of assessing compliance on the banks, while the U.S. gave that power to consumers through litigation. So if a consumer was defrauded in some way, they would litigate um, and they would get their money back, and banks uh, quickly reacted to that litigation. Um, however, with the, with the banks sort of self-regulating um, and assuming with the assumption that they would reduce their own risk for fraud, um, they didn't solve the problem quickly enough. So it's an example of giving litigation or regulatory power to the consumers that bear the risk um, kind of sol solves the, the problem in and of itself. In the mortgage industry, Matt, you wanna go through this slide? Yeah, so unfortunately, many of us are familiar with the, the subprime mortgage crisis, but um, basically there was the inability to uh, anticipate the bubble uh, short of a few individuals, uh, which um, was Mike, Michael Lewis was the author that, uh, that, that chronicled those few individuals. But um, yeah, basically with the risk were undertaken with the incorrect assumption that the conditions would remain favorable. We thought that, you know, uh, mortgages were secure and it would, you know, you could keep banking on that and package it with other um, uh, other financial services. Um, there was obviously large scale fallout, millions of foreclosures, and short sales. Um, and did, did you have anything on this, Shannon, too, that you wanted to touch on? No, it's just like that. How can huge risk exist in a whole economy without somebody recognizing it and reducing the burden? Um, we see that in healthcare right now, and it's it, we have a very recent, um, recent, pretty huge crisis um, example in our past. 
Um, I'm going to skip the sterile injectable, but show it on the slide for a minute. Um, just uh, it's another example of how we think that the market should sufficiently incentivize, you know, supply of drugs. Um, but sometimes if the company can't get enough ROI, it, the, the supply can fall. Uh, the analogy there being you'd think a company would secure a product. Um, but if they can't get the ROI on the marketplace, they might leave it, um, leave it sort of poor cyber hygiene or, or, or poor securability in that product. So here's a list of how economists solve these market incentive problems. Ex ante regulation is when a regulator has certain requirements, compliance requirements, before something goes on the marketplace. And what's the analogy here for the medical device industry, Matt? Um, so, yeah, this would be the, essentially the FDA having basic requirements. Um, we do see a number of requirements from, you know, again, the Mayos and, and some of the customers out there that will specifically say we will not buy or we will not purchase medical devices unless they have these requirements. But, yeah, an example of ex ante uh, ante regulation um, would be like, say, the FDA had a list of these requirements. Yep, and that's just for medical devices. That doesn't count the things that FDA doesn't regulate, like electronic medical records, telehealth solutions, data storage formats, et cetera. Um, ex post liability is when you get in trouble when you bear a risk. So, you know, it, it, this could be FDA enforcement, but uh, unfortunately, the problem there is somebody has to die before, or, or major problems have to occur before that liability can be traced back to, to medical device manufacturer or a healthcare product manufacturer. And it has to be a very clear cause and effect. Um, and unfortunately, that's pretty tough with cyber. Information disclosure is another regulatory uh, trick. So arm consumers with more information than the manufacturer would be naturally willing to provide by requiring specific disclosures. And we'll get, in, get into an example of that in a minute, actually just right now. So the uh, ex ante regulation that Matt was talking about is FDA post-market surveillance or pre-market surveillance. Um, FDA does product benefit risk reviews and cybersecurity risks would be inside of that existing regulation. But you'd expect our regulator to have just as many cybersecurity engineers as they have biomedical engineers, but they're not quite that ready yet. Uh, FDA is doing an incredible job moving quickly and has been a innovative regulator, uh, but more resources would probably be valuable. Um, an ingredient list is a, is a required information disclosure for food producers. So is a software bill of materials for medical devices. Um, right now, it's actually voluntary, but as soon enough, it will likely become a mandated information disclosure. And that doesn't solve cybersecurity problems in itself, but it solves the market incentive problems. Suddenly, there will be sort of transparency um, on, for example, whether or not medical device components are reliably patchable. Matt, you want to speak to some of it, what's going on in the healthcare sector with respect to um, Market incentives? Uh, sure. So, you know, as a lot of us that are involved with a number of the working groups, whether it's Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council, HISAC, um, you know, there's a number of initiatives to try to, uh, you know, bring to the market, you know, more of, uh, you know, um, more gu these guidance or requirements, um, you know, whether it's FDA, health, as I said, Healthcare, Se healthcare Sector Coordinating Council, um, HISAC. Um, CISA, all of these organizations through various working groups uh, are doing work in these sectors. Um, and I, I'm going quickly, but I know we're tight on time as well. Uh, yeah, it's just not enough. Um, so the, the, the overall takeaway from this talk is economics has a role in reducing cyber risk specific for the healthcare industry. And there's, there's not enough going on right now. The market incentives of, of, with the current regulatory approach is not, is not sufficient to reduce risk and the industry is not going to solve it on its own. Um, Matt, you want to close us out? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I think 
working in the industry, we keep kind of looking at the same way we've always done it. Um, in discussing this talk and some of the other economic approaches to other industries, I think it's it's nice to be able to kind of take a step back and look at other industries, see what's worked for them, um, and see what's been you know proven to work in those industries. Um, you know, healthcare is a little bit different in that we, in, in Shannon talked about, we have the different players. So it's not like say an Apple watch or I buy the Apple watch and I assess it based on my requirements. But, you know, we have medical device manufacturers selling to uh, health delivery organizations that are then providing services to patients. So there's there, there's a couple different players and then regulators as well. So, um, you know, we don't have the clear incentives. Uh, everyone does isn't incentivized in the same way, all of those different players uh, to make uh, secure medical devices. So, um, yeah, we just kind of wanted to open up the discussion, which we'll have a uh, question and answer soon. We can kind of talk a little bit in greater depth about that. But yeah, we just kind of wanted to present the uh, some other economic uh, possibilities for uh, managing cybersecurity risk uh, in healthcare. Thanks.